Uh, my name is Omar Klein, and my talk is about getting the hang of WASM, which is an acronym for WebAssembly. So this talk is mainly me fooling around with WebAssembly uh, in the hopes that you will get an idea of how awesome it is. Uh, these slides are really a Jupyter notebook, um, and all the code is executed live. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Should I start over? <laughs> okay, so this talk is about WebAssembly, uh, and I hope to, to give you an idea of how, how great uh, of a thing it is. Um, so in this talk, uh, I'll use some code examples which uh, make use of a small library called WASMFun, which I wrote. Uh, it's a small library that basically makes it easy to compose WebAssembly modules from Python. And we're going to start right away with importing it. So what is WebAssembly? WebAssembly is a low-level representation of code, as the name might suggest, uh, which is designed to be very easily uh, transformable into a real machine code um, at the last moment by the browser. And it's designed to be fast. Um, so we're going to start right away by writing a couple of uh, WebAssembly instructions. Uh, so we write three instructions, uh, one where we push the number 42 on a the stack, then we call a function print line, so to print the number 42, and then we call a function called make background blue. Um, and in a few moments we'll execute this code in the browser. Um, so we wrote some instructions, now we can, what's, WebAssembly consists of modules, so these functions are first packed, uh, sorry, these instructions are first packed into a uh, function object, uh, which we call main, which makes them uh, automatically be called when the magic module gets uh, loaded. Um, and we pack that thing up into a module again. And obviously, we had with this two function calls, like print line and make background glue. WebAssembly doesn't have these functions by default. Actually, WebAssembly uh, cannot do a lot by itself, but all like, the, the interesting stuff that you want to do, uh, you have to import uh, from the host environment. So the host environment, which is JavaScript in this case, will provide this function. And here we are saying that this module needs this functionality. So uh, now we have a WebAssembly module. We can like peek and give an idea of what this looks like. So every WebAssembly module consists of different sections. For instance, the type sections at the top uh, defines all the signatures of all the functions that are, you, are defined in the module or imported in the module. Uh, we have some a section that defines the, th the stuff that is imported in the module, uh, etc. And down here at the bottom you see uh, the function definition and you, you can see the, uh, the instructions that we just defined. So um, another nice thing about WebAssembly is that uh, it is designed to be a compact binary format. And the reason behind this is that uh, if you load a web application, um, you don't want this to take a long time to, to load the WebAssembly module. So the, the format is designed to be compact and it's binary. And we can like, uh, turn our uh, module object into like, the, the real binary representation by calling the two bytes function. And we can see that it's 93 bytes to execute these three instructions. Uh, you can also see like the, it starts with uh, a zero and uh, the, the letters ASM, which is like a magic string to indicate that this is indeed a WebAssembly module. So basically, this is it. We can like execute this in the browser, um, which we'll do in just a second. Um, so WebAssembly is safe. I already mentioned there's not a lot that, that WebAssembly can do by itself. Uh, for instance, if you want to access the document object model in the browser or any other browser-specific stuff, then JavaScript will have to provide this functionality to the WebAssembly module. Similarly, if you have WebAssembly that runs on a desktop, the host environment can provide functionality to, for instance, access the file system. Um, yeah. So that's, we need to, uh, to actually do this. So here we define uh, basically a, a Python string with some JavaScript in there. And we define the print line function, the make background blue function. And, uh, and here we have a, a little function that does the actual compilation. The code over here is really the uh, browser API uh, to, to compile the module. And in the end, we provide it with a dictionary with the functions that our module needs. 
So now we're almost there, because now we have uh, a binary representation and we have the JavaScript. Uh, the only thing that we need to do then is inject these two into the browser and we can execute our code. And that we do with this little function. Uh, I'm not going to into details of this, but this is really just uh, IPython um, stuff to inject it, to bring it over to the browser. So now we can run our module. So you can see that the number 42 has been printed and obviously the background has turned blue. I'm going to turn it back to gray because it's annoying. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. Don't think that's a color. Yeah. Okay, so let's do the same thing, but now make it a little bit more inst interesting. Uh, we can define instructions that define a for loop in uh, WebAssembly instructions. Of course, this, this looks horrible. You don't want to write code <coughs> manually like this, uh, but you'll have to believe me that this is a for loop running from 0 to 10, printing like here, printing the uh, iterable at each iteration. Again, we can uh, wrap these instructions into a function and then into a module. In this case, we only need one uh, import function. We can show that it consists of a number of bytes. And um, we can run it in a notebook. So this library, uh, WASM fun, has some functionality, run WASM in notebook, which basically does what we just did, but uh, easier. <laughs> and we can see uh, the for loop running. Okay, so another nice thing about WebAssembly, that although it is designed for the web uh, to run in the browser, it is uh, extremely likely that it will run on mobile devices as well, uh, and it already runs on uh, desktop using, for instance, Node, but there are also other projects where you can run uh, WebAssembly in, uh, on the desktop. Uh, that means that any code that you can uh, get into uh, the format of WebAssembly will eventually, in a few years, basically run anywhere, and that's something that uh, I get very excited about. Um, so here we have a function run WASM in Node, which is basically Python uh, calling out in a sub-process to Node and running the uh, WebAssembly module that we just wrote, but then we run it on a desktop, and we get the same result. So before moving on, um, I want to stress that WebAssembly is an open standard. Uh, it's not owned by anyone. And uh, everybody is on board. So there's people from Mozilla, Google, uh, Microsoft, and Apple all collaborating on making this work. So this is uh, really a thing that's going to happen. Um, moving on to BrainFuck. So BrainFuck is an esoteric language uh, that's uh, very easy. It's very, uh, well, it's very simple in that it has only eight commands, but it's extremely difficult to write code in BrainFuck. Um, so it's not a language that's meant to be taken seriously. But because it's so simple, it's an interesting language, because it makes it very easy to uh, transform brainfuck brain commands into WebAssembly instructions. And that is done with this function, which is, well, I have to zoom out a little bit, but it's not much. Where's my mouse? Ah. So this is uh, the hello world for BrainFuck. It's awful. I didn't write it because I, I'm not smart enough to do this. But um, we have the uh, function uh, that we just defined, bf to instructions. Um, maybe I can show you that it actually produces instructions. So you get a lot of uh, WebAssembly instructions. And then we, again, we wrap these instructions into a function, and then we wrap the function into a module. Uh, we also give uh, a hint that we need a function called print char codes, which we provide um, through JavaScript. And so you can see here that we also provide a memory section, because BrainFuck needs a piece of memory to write stuff to. Um, and that's it. We can run it in a notebook. Hello. Okay, so doing this again, this is another piece of brain fuck. It's slightly longer, it calculates Fibonacci numbers. Um, we're doing the exact same thing and we can run it. And we can see that it generates Fibonacci numbers. Okay, let's make this more interesting. Um, I wrote a Python to WebAssembly compiler. 
Uh, I didn't have a lot of time to do this, so I cut a lot of corners. For instance, all the values are assumed to be floating point numbers. Um, so it's not, uh, you, you cannot do a lot with it, but you can calculate pi or Fibonacci numbers to do this. Um, so for instance, here's a piece, piece of Python code that uh, calculates uh, the first 10 Fibonacci numbers. You can uh, use XX to execute it in Python. It works just fine. So how we're going to move from Python code to WebAssembly? Obviously, Python is a lot harder to, you know, to understand for a computer than, web, than BrainFuck, for instance. Uh, but luckily, Python itself has a module called AST, which turns Python code into an abstract syntax tree. And an abstract syntax tree is a, a representation of code that is in the form of a tree, and that's much easier to pass. parse. Sorry. And then when we have this tree, we can turn it into uh, WebAssembly by basically walking over the tree, and as we do so, we generate these WebAssembly instructions. Um, and that is uh, done by this function. It doesn't fit on the slides, but it's only 200 lines of code. So it's, it's more difficult than the BrainFuck for version. Uh, but it took me one morning to write, and it's not, it's not rocket science. <laughs> Obviously, if you want to support full Python, it's going to be a lot more difficult. Um, so basically, this is what the pi to WASM function looks like. We start by uh, parsing uh, uh, the Python code using the built-in functionality to get a tree. Then we walk over the tree in this bit to generate uh, WebAssembly instructions. And then, as we did a couple of times before now, we wrap it in a function and we wrap it in a module. And that's basically it. So here we have our... Uh, we generate our module, we call PyWSM on this piece of code. We can see that it's 187 uh, bytes, and we can run it in a notebook. And I designed my slides <laughs> with the font a bit larger, but that's okay. Okay. Let's make this a bit more interesting. Let's calculate the 4,000th prime number in Python. Uh, so this code does exactly that, and it also prints out how long it took to do this. And I chose 4,000 because it takes Python just about four seconds to do this. Oh, a little bit more this time. Um, so now we can take this code, we can turn it into w, uh, to WebAssembly using our function, and we can run it in a notebook and it takes 0.2 seconds. I think maybe my battery saver is on or something, because normally the numbers are slightly lower, but it's okay. Um, and then we can do the same and also run it on the desktop in Node. And I think it's about the same speed. Uh, just like a week ago, Firefox was slightly slower. I was surprised yesterday that it was faster again because there was a new release, obviously, and uh, so, so in the meantime, uh, Firefox got faster at executing WebAssembly. Okay, so summarizing, WebAssembly is a format that is compact, safe, and open, uh, and I believe that it will give rise to a lot of exciting new things, uh, and it will, in my opinion, also have implication on Python. What these implications are is hard to say right now, but uh, it's definitely something to keep an eye out for, I think. So, thank you for your attention. Um, are there any advantages, of, uh, advantages to compiling uh, Python to WebAssembly compared to compiling Python to C? Um, that's a good question. One advantage would be you would be able to run it in the browser. Uh, but other than that, it's not that it's magically going faster or anything, unless you do something like PyPy is doing or like Dropbox is trying to do. Um, so by default, it will be a lot of work, and then it will only work in the browser. So then it might not be worth the effort. Thank you for your talk. Um, how compatible would uh, Python bytecode be to WebAssembly? So 
compatible in what way? Sorry. Well, translatable, maybe easier than the AST. Right. So you mean turning Python bytecode into WebAssembly? Um, yeah, I can imagine that that would be one possible uh, approach of doing it. Um, you, you'd have to like look at the API calls that are then made, and, and I think it's possible. Yeah. Um, so I had a, a quick uh, question: Is um, is WebAssembly like is the closest language to WebAssembly something like LLVM uh, intermediate representation, or is it slightly higher level because it seems very low level? Yeah, it's it's very low level. I think it's it might be uh, it's it's around the same same uh, level of, of low, uh, you know, lowness. <laughs> uh, I think at some point they uh, considered using uh, intermediate representation or LLVM intermediate representation to uh, well, to use for WebAssembly, but uh, there are a couple of things where that, why they decided not to do that, and one of the things was safety. So you have this like more contained environment where you really import only the functionality that you that you need. Um, I have two questions. The the first one is: Do you see any um, like what are the scientific applications of this technology which which you see? And the second question is: You talked about maybe extending the Python capabilities for this. Um, how would you manage like? Um, dynamic or, or static linking using of external libraries, dependencies of your program, and so on on the browser? Right. Um, I think the, the main thing why I find stuff like this interesting is because uh, as a scientist, I think as a scientist we will keep doing most of our stuff on the desktop, I believe. Um, but it will be interesting because it might play a role in how we can like publish our results online to to have like interactive uh, applications where you can sort of demonstrate or uh, visualize, visualize your results. Um, but also, um, there might be ways in which you, you have like a language where you, that you can use on the desktop and you can use the same language in, uh, to, to create apps for the browser, but that's more like longer time uh, advantages that you can have from it. And the other thing was about um, binding to... Yeah, so in the browser, there's no, no, you cannot like load other C libraries. So if you have code that, that depends on something that's written, that's, that's spec'd into a library, then you cannot run that code in the browser. Then, uh, but because you can run WebAssembly on the desktop, you could still run that code in an environment and make the environment do the binding for you, for instance. So, yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Oh, okay, one, one last question, then coffee break. Uh, does there exist uh, a general C, C++ compiler that compiles into uh, WebAssembly so that you could uh, embed the Python interpreter itself? Or? Uh, I'm not sure about the status, but like the original idea is to have LLVM intermediate representation and then have a uh, WebAssembly, um, I call it the backend. So they can, like now you have mscripten that turns uh, LLVM intermediate representation into uh, asm.js. Uh, and that is uh, basically being replaced by a WebAssembly backend. Yeah, that's the idea. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, coffee break time. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Alma. Thank